I just had the uh, pleasure of meeting um, meeting Jenny Lumet, and I, whenever I think about Lena Horne, I'm always reminded of this story, um, which my mother tells me. Um, my my parents made the very brave decision in the '60s to um, to get married. Um, in fact, they met at, at BU. My mother is of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, and my father is Somali, and so there was a lot of risk in that in that. Um, relationship and the risk was that my my mother's Ashkenazi Jewish family from the old country from Russia would um, disown her, which in fact they did, and um, it, it all works out in the end. But so they they disowned her, um, and my my grandmother my grandfather's sister, my aunt, great aunt Celia, who was a very kind woman who had never had children of her own and felt very close to my mother. And when my mother was pregnant with me. This woman who came from the old country when she was about eight or nine didn't have a very, a very large frame of reference. And so when I was born, she said, is she going to look like Lena Horne? And I, I say that because I, I just, I told Jenny that, and she said, please tell everybody. I, I have a very fond, I, I love Lena Horne, and because of that, I love you. So, <laughs> so that's the story that they asked me to tell, and thank you. Enjoy the movie. Um, thank you all for coming out. We ambushed Nora. We were standing in the aisle and we'd never met and she told the story and Beth and I were like, just get up on, just get up and say it. So, sorry. Just super quick before I talk about this movie. I was born in New York City in Lenox Hill Hospital. I was raised in New York City. I'm gonna die there and it's fine. I'm gonna die in my apartment and they're gonna find me two weeks later and it's gonna be fine because that's kind of how I wanna go. The only non-New york -y thing that I like is the Coolidge Theater in Boston, I swear. Um, you guys are so dope. Thank you for being here. These movies matter. Uh, they matter especially now and a commitment to movies in this very weird movies like this, but all movies matter in this weird world we're in now. Quick note, if you are a movie cineast buff person, I would ask you to pay attention to the lengths of the takes during the dance numbers. Renee, I think you probably know about this because you're like a super genius. She's like nodding because she's like, I'm Renee, I'm a super genius. Okay, fine. Um, so here's the thing. I really love movies and my son, who is an actor in movies and on television is the fifth generation of our family who is in show business. Uh, Lena's mother, Edna, was in the tent shows in the Deep South. So that there's Edna, Lena, and then my, on my father's side, my grandpa Baruch, and then my father, Sidney Lumet, who's a director, and then me, and my, my mom's an academic, which is kind of like show business, apparently, in Boston, <laughs> and, um, and my son, Jacob. So since the reconstruction, none of us have held a steady job. <laughs> um, <laughs> movies like this are important because they're about commitment and effort and adversity. And sometimes you sort of look around and you see that there are many movies about superheroes or like really good looking adolescents in some kind of dystopia and like they're mad about something and I can't, it's like, ugh, and I'm like, something's really bad and I can't quite figure it out, but they're all really attractive. <laughs> and this movie, and movies like this required an enormous effort on the part of every single person involved, even to get, even to be finished. If one knows anything about the time, this is 1942, 1943, um, what every actor in the movie had to endure simply to get to the sound stage um, and how it was a journey of, from the reasonable safety of your home into uh, an uns through an unsafe physical space to the reasonable safety of the studio and then back again. And yet they did all this. And my feeling is that people who so love it to go through all that to do this are uniquely American and uniquely valuable, and more so than the superhero stuff. Um, I, 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 stakes and art, I think, are like this. And I uh, often think about those who simply could not because of the stuff, right? I think all the artists in this movie um, are extraordinary 
and they were doing it facing something that most of us in this room have not had to deal with on the scale that they did. So, uh, and besides that, they have a joyful time. So to eke joy out of a time, I think is a really important lesson for me anyway, I mean, I don't know, but you know. Um, so thank you, and Renee and I will be speaking afterwards. I don't have, know if I have anything valuable, uh, valuable to say. I think I just blew it all right now, but you never know. Okay, thank you. You know, when I, I haven't seen that movie in its entirety in a very long time, but I'm always watching clips on YouTube. And watching the movie in, in its fullness, I see this A-list of black excellence. Mm. Mm. Yes. That's what I see. What do you see? You have seven minutes, and uh, you know, I was thinking, oh, I could just call it up on my phone and be like, okay, can you guys see? Can you guys see? Um, there's a seven-minute clip on YouTube of her singing Stormy Weather, segging into Believe from The Wiz. Um, from Lady and Her Music, but the song is a completely different song when she sings it at the age of 65 or however old she was during Lady and Her Music than that song. I mean, MGM told her, don't sing with your mouth open, Lena. So she had to, uh, there was an enormous amount of control that they were imposing upon her. When I see that movie, I think, I think of a lot of things. I mean, you have to remember that I am now older than she was when we met. I don't know that woman. I didn't meet that woman. I met a very different woman. Um, here's what I can tell you about that movie. So that was 1942, 1943, and Renee, you probably know a lot of this. So that movie was released the same year as Cabin in the Sky, and it was also the year that she was the first black person to sing at the Savoy Ballroom in the Midtown Savoy, which is the fanciest ballroom in Manhattan. And it had these perfect acoustics, so you never used a mic. And she was singing at the Savoy. She stayed there a year. She wasn't allowed to sleep there, because even though it was a hotel, she slept at the Hotel Teresa on 125th Street, because the Savoy wouldn't have her. So she was, at that time, uh, the highest paid Negro in America. And that year, she toured with the USO. You might know this story. She was on tour with the USO, and this is that year. And she said that she was always thankful for that year in terms of success because it allowed her to do what she did on that USO tour. And she had been saying, where are the black GIs? Where are the black GIs? And she hadn't gotten to sing for any black GIs. And she said, I'll sing in the kitchen or I'll sing in the laundry. So she was brought to the stage and here are the white officers and the white GIs. And there's the band. And there, behind the stage are the German POWs and behind them are the black American GIs, right? So she, and this was at the height of her success and she was able to, surprise, she's actually, she actually made it through that night. The music started, and she turned her back and took an apple box and walked down the, the steps of the stage and stood in the middle of the black GIs and sang to them. And the USO kicked her out. Um, and it's funny because they don't on their website, I'm still pissed at them. Um, my father always said, "If what's the point of holding a grudge if you're not gonna hold it forever? <laughs> yeah. So I would appreciate an apology from the USO in the name of my family. Thank you very much. If we ever get around to it. Um, so uh, it was a very emotional year. There was also uh, only two years earlier, she had signed this contract. This is a Fox movie, but she had signed this contract with MGM. And this is not an MGM movie because they didn't know quite what to do with her. Um, and the contract with MGM, it's this rather sort of famous story about how she brought her father, um, his name is Teddy Horn from Brooklyn, um, who my mother insists was a sportsman, but everybody else in Brooklyn knows was just a straight up gangster. <laughs> my mom went to Radcliffe, so she's very like, like cardigans, and you know what I mean? Okay, you guys know that, okay. So, um, 
So she didn't know how to handle Mr. Mayor because she was, wasn't brought up to deal with him. This is Louis B. Mayer. This is Louis B. Mayer. At uh, MGM. At MGM. So uh, she asked her father to come negotiate her contract with her. And Teddy Horn had a white cashmere suit and he had this little silver sticky poker that he used to poke people when they got in his way in, in nightclubs and stuff like that. And he was a straight up pimp and a straight up gangster and so was Louis B. Mayer. So they got along like a fucking house of fire. <laughs> and um, so he walked in and there's grandma who's very demure. And he said, my daughter is not gonna play a maid and she's not gonna play a, uh, like a jungle woman. Here she was playing an actress playing a jungle woman, so I guess maybe it's different, although I gotta say I love the zebra outfits, I would totally wear that. And they negotiated this contract where she simply wouldn't, she wouldn't do that. And that led to an enormous amount of pushback from black actors, and it's kind of heartbreaking, to work as a black actor besides the stuff that you had to go through. And when I mentioned earlier, if you think about what, all those extras, and that exquisite young man who in the scene backstage in the white shirt and the black pants who just dances out of nowhere, that and you're just, who is this extraordinary, these extraordinary talents? Um, if you wanted to dance, this, is, this makes me so sad, if you wanted to work in a studio in Hollywood, besides doing what you had to do, there was a sort of a cabal of big time black actors to whom you had to kick back. Uh, and they were furious and I don't want to say the names, or maybe I should, I'll think about it, but they were furious. Say them. Uh, Step and Fetch It, um, Ethel Waters, um, Louise Dandridge, um, and the hero, actually, of the story is the wonderful and the glorious Miss Hattie McDaniel, God bless her. Um, but uh, they were furious and tried to block Grandma from working, and there was this rather big powwow at Hattie McDaniel's huge mansion about what w the danger that she was putting them all in. The argument is an old one. The, the tipping factor, I think, for me was the fact that these guys were shaking down other black actors. Hattie McDaniel threw her weight behind Grandma, and uh, she wasn't, and she was then, she was frozen out until that moment. Um, so it was a very emotional, bunch of years, besides all the other stuff that goes on in this country. So when you see the exquisiteness and the precision in those performances, and we were talking about the length of the takes, nobody's cutting away. You know, the Nicholas Brothers were dancing for, what, 12 minutes? You know, those were long takes. Um, nobody, there wasn't room, there wasn't time, there wasn't money, right? So for people who were enduring all that stuff, to do that, I think that's really American and really extraordinary. And um, I, I, so that's what I think about when I see this movie. H Hattie McDaniel, for those who don't remember, uh, was the first black performer to win an Academy Award. Uh, she played Mammy in Gone with the Wind. Yep. Um, and I think it was Hattie McDaniel who said she would rather um, make $10,000 playing a maid than earn $10 being, being a maid. A maid. How did, she helped, she is apparent, I never met the woman, but God bless her, she's, a, she's apparently a friend of the family and I love her for what she did. You, you mentioned your grandmother's the studio, the uh, contract she signed with MGM, mm -hmm. and she was the first African-American performer to have a long-term contract, it was mm -hmm. seven years long. Um, and she did Stormy Weather, she did Cabin in the Sky, but the career didn't happen. Career because didn't happen. ultimately, Hollywood really didn't know what to do with her. No, I mean, and she, she'll speak very frankly about it, that they seem to want her to be a sort of an imitation of a white woman and at the same time be a credit to all black people, which is, first of all, those aren't very specific goals. I mean, how do you do that? Do you turn left? Do you turn right? I don't know how you do either one of those things. They're also enormous. So what to do with this woman? And... Um, there's the story of, you know, uh, the great showboat story, which I'm sure you know, which I don't know if you guys know, which is uh, she was supposed to play Julie in the musical Showboat, and Julie the is- The tragic the, mulatto. The tragic mulatto. Shout out to mulattoes, by the way, because here we go. But um, for the, <laughs> the, the tragic mulatto. So when she first got there, uh, the makeup that existed for black actors was burnt cork, 
and it was bur burnt at different degrees. Um, so, which is what was used in minstrel shows. Yes, which is what was, was used in minstrel shows, and it was still being used in the 40s until um, the actual Max Factor um, created something for her called a color for her called light Egyptian. And light Egyptian, uh, so I think it might still exist, and they wound up putting it all over Ava Gardner to play Julie in Showboat, and she was, uh, she didn't dub, Grandma sang the track, and then Ava sang over it, and then another act, a white actor sang over Ava, and then Grandma, and then Ava was supposed to uh, use Grandma's choreography. So, they didn't quite know what to do, also with a woman of obvious intellectual power. So she sang in cabarets and she sang in nightclubs and that was her life for a long time. But they would put her in these musicals like Till the Clouds Roll By yeah. and Words and Music, but they were very strategically placed, edited. Edited, about that? sure. She would be the nightclub performer, some, uh, sometimes you know, dressed in this slightly Latin sort of garb that I, and I never really understood it. Um, and she would show up and sing a song and then go away. And below the Mason-Dixon line, she wasn't allowed to be on screen with white performers, so she was uh, filmed so she could be, her parts or her numbers could be edited out and just left on the floor. So what do you do and what do you think when you're doing your work and you're doing some of your best work and working at the highest level, and someone just goes, tss, tss. so one would think, oh, well, why bother? But I, what I appreciate about any artist, any real artist, is that they will do no matter what. Um, and people always think of these guys as performers. I'm like, artists, no, artists. Now, how did she bear that burden? Because she had this sense she was the first. Mm. The NAACP told her to be exemplary, yes. to represent the race properly. Yes. How did she bear that burden for so long? Because she was alone. In, in doing this, and making this decision that she was never going to take racially demeaning roles. And it cost her, because she wouldn't do it. Uh, and there was a film they wanted her to do, I think it was St. Louis Woman. Yeah, and she's and a hooker. she was supposed to play this, essentially a whore in love with a jockey. And she refused. But she was under contract, and so they suspended her. And I think I'd, I'd read that was one of the reasons yeah. why she, what they didn't lend her out for, for Showboat. There are so many stories, and mine are all jumbled in my head, so I'm just gonna rely on Renee to get them straight. As a grandma, because she was also a grandma, and remember, I didn't know this woman, right? I knew a woman who was, um, she lived in hotels, so she taught me how to sign for room service when I was seven. <laughs> it's a really good skill, really good skill. We're not a highly, we, can do, we have a limited skill set, um, my family. She was aware. She had very complicated feelings about it. She had very complicated feelings about her own physicality and her own beauty. I learned a lot about beauty and what it means from her. The aspects of colorism, which for those who aren't familiar, it's a proximity, if, if you're of color, a proximity to whiteness makes your life easier. Um, my proximity to whiteness makes my life easier. Darker skinned, darker complected, if you look at that movie, there weren't any dark, dark complected women with the exception of uh, the woman in the, in the, like the cafe with Fats Waller. Ada Brown. Yeah. Ada Brown, and then she was cast in Chick's show as a mammy, if you saw her in her, so how do you get to be a light complected black person in America? Well, it's a pretty ugly history. So what do you do with that? And what you, do you do with all the love that you have for your people and all the, f the feelings from your people about why you're in this position? I can't answer you in the sense that she did yoga. No, that didn't fucking happen. Um, she didn't do yoga. I mean, she was very, very funny and an autodidact. She read everything, um, everything. She hung out with musicians and hairdressers and kept her circle very, very small. So I think uh, she was very reclusive and I think that her, if you look at her nightclub performances, it's all about you are there and I am here. 
and it's very, very precise. Because if you're being asked to do all these impossible things, you have to protect yourself in some way. Um, at the same time, she sang with Kermit, you know? And she and Kermit were tight, Kermit the Frog. Um, and she drank Hennessy out of a Sesame Street mug and was just like a grandma. I mean, that's what my grandma does. I don't know if that's what your grandma does. So she wasn't a font of wisdom. She didn't, you know, say wise black people stuff. She just lived her life. And I think, is there a dog here? There's a dog here, right, named Spumoni? Right. There's a do and I was very happy that Spumoni was here because grandma had these, um, she had these pug dogs and they lived in the sleeves of her kimono. And I thought they were dead forever because they never moved and I didn't want to say anything because like they're dead, but they weren't. And they, um, they had a chef named Irene and they never, ever, ever went outside. And so she loved these pugs more than anything in the entire world. And so thank you Spumoni for showing up and representing the canine <laughs> contingent. I appreciate it. Huh? Oh, good. Good, good, good. I, want, I want to ask about the 1950s with your grandmother. Mm. Uh, she was blacklisted during the Red Scare. Yeah, she was not written down on any list. It's interesting. Um, Actually. <laughs> tell me, no, 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 because I'd, I'd like, tell me. Um, PBS did American Masters yeah, in 1996, and it actually shows a list. And she's on it. With her name on it, and it has, you know, depending on how many stars you have next to your name, that's how much of a communist you're supposed to be. Right. And she had five out of five stars. See, here, well, here's the thing, before, I mean, I understand it's a liberal crowd, but before we do this, so, her mother was a woman named Cora Calhoun, and Grandma grew up in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, right? And Cora Calhoun was a wildly political intellectual and an educator in Brooklyn. And one of her mentees was a young man who she chased off a street corner in Harlem named Paul Robeson. And they, grew all, they all grew up in the same house. And Paul Robeson gave Grandma her political education at Cafe Society downtown with the great Barney Josephson, thank you for him. Um, but he said to her, she said, should I be a communist? And he said, no, God no, Lena, you like things too much. <laughs> so, and she did. So she thought of herself as a fellow traveler, um, more so because she couldn't, because she was wrapped in like cashmere and futon every second, so you can't actually be a, co you know, a communist if you're dripping with pearls. <laughs> I heard an interesting story, and I don't know if it's true, but I'll, it could be true, and if any of you guys want to believe it, that's fine with me. So she had to make an, she wrote a letter. She was going to have to testify, and she wrote a letter to a conservative radio host, whose name is escaping me right now, in New York City, saying this is why um, I believe in America, I believe in, I'm not a communist, but I believe in this, 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 and this. Um, and she, and I wish I had more details, you guys, sorry, I can't think of it right now. But um, she got through, she said that she belonged to the same organizations that Mrs. Roosevelt belonged to. And ultimately she came through on the other side, but here's the thing. One of her allies, um, and I have actually a bracelet that he gave her, was a guy called Bugsy Siegel, and apparently the conversation was from Mr. Siegel to the conservative radio host. She's not a fucking communist. She has to open at the sands. Click. <laughs> so, you know, American politics are like that. <laughs> American, American politics, are, he was very, apparently very nice to her and gave her a very lovely star sapphire bracelet, which I do actually happen to have. So thank you, Mr. Siegel. You're a crazy murderer, but God bless you. I mean, do, do you think she was targeted partially because of her activism? I mean, even in what she was doing in Hollywood in deciding I'm not going to take certain roles, I'm not going to demean my culture, do you think she was targeted? Yes, I think anybody, to this day, it's fair to say that, any, that our country, and please understand that I'm speaking historically and generally, right? Because um, sometimes these conversations can be tricky, but I'm speaking historically and generally. Um, but it, it's pretty safe to say that this country likes its people of color to behave. This country also, like its, also likes its women to behave. Um, and if you're both, you're fucked, pretty much. Um, so I think that she was supposed to be grateful all the time. Um, 
and so yes, you have burnt cork on your face, and yes, sometimes when you tour, they will burn the sheets that you slept on, and yes, you are not allowed, allowed to stay here, and yes, come in the back, but be grateful. So to make no to choose to make noise about that is a very personal decision, and anybody can is within their rights to do exactly what they please. Uh, she made more noise in the 60s and 70s than she did in the early part of her career, a lot of ha it having to do with her exposure to Mr. Robeson and also the wonderful um, Count Basie, who, it's another story I'll tell you in a minute. Um, I know, right? It does not stop. Whenever I talk to my mom every five minutes, like another hugely famous person, I'm like, wait, wait, mom, stop, what? She goes, no, that was the time when grandma was in space. I'm like, no, that didn't actually happen. <laughs> I think that if you are an ungrateful, this is gonna sound really, really um, rugged, you guys, and I apologize, but I think that if you are female, and I think that if you are of color, and I think that if you are a lot of other things, so I'm not just, I'm not just, but there's a punitive element that comes into it. The how dare you, the be grateful, the just, shh. sing with your mouth closed, Lena. I mean, I think that's, that's pretty much what it is. And I mentioned the YouTube clip because she was, because she was free as an artist singing Stormy Weather. So if you have, and it's a very, very different song. And if you have seven minutes, check it out and see the difference between this stormy weather and the one when she is fully herself. The, the feeling is it's, it's that you exist at the benevolence yes. of the greater culture. Yes. And as you said, you must always be grateful. Yes. And your ingratitude is punished. Correct. And, and she suffered that. Yes, she did. Um, so how did she persevere? What kept her going? You know, Hollywood, it devours creative people, mm -hmm. especially women, mm -hmm. especially women of color. Mm -hmm. How did she persevere? I haven't the foggiest. I can't imagine. You know, I hear about, I work in show business, and I work with people, you know, and they're like, I don't have, like, my assistant, and I can't, and I can't, and I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> I have my diva moments, but I mean, damn. I don't know. Um, how does anybody, pers everybody has a story. I don't mean to be claiming all this stuff, and I'm not claiming all this stuff. I'm just saying that her, that was her story. Everybody has one, everybody endures. We're all still sitting here in this theater, so everybody got through what they needed to get through, and here we are. Uh, she was a particular soul in a particular package. You know, it's funny, whenever I see her on the big screen, I'm like, this is the most beautiful woman I have seen in my entire life. It's just like, wow, what is it like to just walk around with that, looking like that all the time? It must be weird. I can tell you. I have no fucking idea. I mean, it's just like, wow, it's crazy pants. It's crazy pants. And she looked like that all the time, so she has freckles, or she had freckles. Well, you're talking about you know, we're talking about the perseverance and the fact that you're in that industry. After everything you would have heard from her and from your father, yeah. what made you decide to do it? Well, what the fuck else was I supposed to do? I mean, there's like this, nobody ever knows how to hold a job in my entire family. We've never been to an office um, since the reconstruction. So it never, if I could have been like the family rebel and like gone to college and been an accountant, that would have been great. Um, it would have been great. I would have loved it. I, um, I don't, I, it doesn't occur to me to be another way, so it's very much not about me, it's about her. But um, also I don't imagine anybody has an easy time doing what they need to do or want to do. So is it more or less difficult for me? It's probably easier because I'm related to all the famous people and, and, and stuff. Now most people would not admit that. Most people, they're full of shit about stuff. I mean, being related to famous people is really great because uh, people attribute things to you that you didn't earn and you get to go and you have access to stuff and you get jobs faster, all that stuff. And it's all real and it's all true. I mean, I would advocate everybody be related to somebody famous or be, if they can, like right now, go out and marry J-Lo, all of you, something. But it's a really great deal. Oh. 
I'm so down for that, I can't even tell you. <laughs> Do you see the battles that she fought now? Do you still see them in your work? Yes. When you're out there? Different. I mean, there's language now, right? Uh, uh, Jim Crow does not exist on the books. On the books. Now. Uh, the decision makers in my business do, are, do not have a very a, a, a diverse perspective. It's a lot of syllables, huh? The decision makers in my business do not have a diverse perspective. Okay, but I'm there. Renee's there, and so we are doing what we're doing because we're doing it. And uh, so it's kind of like the keep slugging away thing. And I don't know you, Renee, but I get the feeling that if I want something done really fast, I would tell you, oh, Renee, you can't do that. And then it would be like done in two seconds. I don't know, Miss Renee, but I just get I, that. I run on hate, so pretty much. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Way motivating. Way motivating. So if someone says, I'm also motivated by, I'm not technically supposed to be here. I'm 52 years old. I'm of color. I'm having a hot flash right now, um, and my business is run by 26-year-old guys. So I take perverse pleasure in being uh, what my dad would call, he was also a fellow traveler who liked things, um, a gremlin from the Kremlin. Are there things you tell your son, your son's an actor, mm -hmm. Jake Carnival, mm -hmm. who I only realized like two days ago, was your son? Oh yeah. Big, I was a big Nurse Jackie fan. I was just like, oh my he's God, really good. He's right? amazing in that. He's really good. Really good. What do you tell him about the business? He knows everything instinctually. He's um, he's born. Thank God. He's also gorgeous, and he's he's no, he, you know, it's all good because he can't. He went off to college and he came back and he still didn't know how to do his laundry. And I was like, what happened? I spent all this money. And he goes, no, these girls just, I was like, fuck. <laughs> fuck. He's really handsome and charming. It's like a nightmare. He's not gonna have to do anything. And he's probably gonna be really famous and it's gonna be horrible. He has a ferocious sense of pride and he and her in us, all of us, um, all of us. And he sees the bodies. You know, some people are born to see the bodies and some people don't. He's, I got lucky and I got two kids that see the bodies. He gets it. It's actually funny because I'm an EP on two Star Trek shows and he's in the new Star Wars series and it's totally torn the family apart because we're not allowed to talk to each other. <laughs> we're under all these NDAs so he can't tell me about stuff that I don't need, like nerd Star Wars stuff and I can't tell him what unbelievably nerdy thing happened on track today. I know. And you don't really play like, but I'm your mom. You have to tell me. I say it, but he can't. He's, and neither can I. It's really funny. Okay, that's, that's good then. He's, yeah. You know, he understands an NDA. How, how did your grandmother want to be remembered? There was the actress. There was the singer. There was the activist, which I always think is a part of her life that activist doesn't get nearly enough credit. She, as an activist. Yeah, I mean, she always said she wanted to sound like Aretha Franklin, and she always said she wanted to dance like the Nicholas Brothers. Um, and she said she wanted to act like an actress, and she would have loved to have been an actress. She understood where she was placed, and in her, in starting from the 50s and forward, she started, move, she started claiming, rec reclaiming her space, or take, making space for herself. Her activism was a huge, was everything that she was proud of. I mean, she loved this. She made friends. But doing this, you know, I don't know how satisfying that is. Maybe she loved it. I, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know. But it's a good gig. Marcia Washington, Megger Evers, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King. I mean, she was there. She was there. In a very real way that there's this She was very the last famous person with Mr. Meeting, Edgar, Mr. Evers. Yeah. Um, with uh, Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. With Lorraine Hansberry yeah. and James Baldwin. Baldwin. God and bless him. she was part of that meeting. She was at that meeting. She sort yeah. of pushed the Kennedy administration to do more on, yeah. on civil rights. Well, Teddy uh, Kennedy wanted everyone to tell him how, what a great job he was doing, is my understanding. And you have, I think it was at, um, was it at Harry Belafonte's apartment. Um, he owned a building on West End Avenue, and you have all these sort of so you have six Kennedy types on one side of the apartment, and you have James Baldwin in his perverse wonderfulness, you know, 
like eyes gleaming at what could possibly fucking happen in this room and a bunch of black people on the other side and Teddy Kennedy's had basic essentially wanted um, and I love me some Kennedy's wanted to wanted like a, a cookie you know like you guys are doing you you go Ted and he what he Bobby, got it's Bobby yeah, Bobby yeah and he um excuse me and um he got quite nearful she you know, one could have a long discussion about the civil rights movement, um, movement and women. Is it, was it the American Society of Negro Women? What was her name? Dorothy Haight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was not allowed to speak at the March on Washington because um, the guys wouldn't let her. So you do what you can within the space that you can, I think. And if that space is smaller or less yeah, less visible, that's okay. I think she was a ferocious activist. I think of her that way. I think of her as, as very much as a, as a bear or a, or a lion in terms of uh, moving things out of the way or sort of picking a bunch of us up and all of us and moving us forward. There are people who just kind of do that. I don't think of her that much as a entertainer. This is not her soul. You know, it's in our, it's, it's artistry, but it's not, or it's performance, but it's not her soul. I don't know how much time we have, have left, but I wanted to ask you. Did, did well, she? I also, if anybody has any questions after Renee's done, I'm more yeah, than happy we'll, to. I'll ask this last one, then we'll throw yeah, yeah. it out. Did she have a sense of accomplishment? Did I, she have a feeling of that, what she had achieved and what she meant to, to people? She was only happy when she was learning something musically artistically, or reading, or from reading. So whenever she accomplished something musically, she had felt a sense of accomplishment. When she accomplished something artistically, she felt a sense, she felt something. She understood that there was Lena Horne who was a symbol, and that was important. I think she got the most satisfaction in small, mo like any of us do, in small, intimate moments. I don't know what she, if she knew what she meant to everybody. She wasn't, she's an extremely quiet person, extremely reserved person. So I can't, I don't imagine her, you know, that I didn't, I never got that. One time we got mobbed at FAO shorts. That's really, and she was very gracious. Um, and that's really all in terms of her interactions. I didn't see how she, how it made her feel. I couldn't tell you. So she wasn't Lena Horne off stage in, in the way people, there are people who are always sort of performing in some kind of no, way. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, she had these, like these sweatpants and these mules that Roger Vivier made for her and those little tennis socks with the pom-poms, right? And this like, this um, Delta Airlines t-shirt. <laughs> and she had like $40,000 worth of um, black pearls at her wrists and this like turban and this with this Chanel gardenia. This is in her house, right? Um, and then she would have these crystal bowls full of legs, pantyhose, and really old candy that your grandma has. You know that, right? Um, so this is very much a grandma, my, I mean, a grandma, um, who liked to read, and she was very close with my son, Jacob, and she was close with me. But there was no, one could make the argument that a woman in $40,000 worth of pearls and sweatpants is a true diva, but there was nothing highfalutin about her. She liked to go on the subway and just take a ride up and down Manhattan. Okay, we'll take some questions. For, actually, first, thank you. Oh, God, no, thank you. <laughs> Renee, thank you. Thank you. This is great. Questions? Who I am? Oh, I'm Renee Graham. I'm a columnist for the Boston Globe. <laughs> well, I just, this is the first time I've seen this movie. I just wondered what the reception was when it came out and if it was a huge hit, if it was a crossover hit, because my parents, I mean, there are these, um, 
Johnny Mercer songs, I mean, incredible songs here. And I heard, I've heard about all these actors like Cab Calloway and who's the guy at the piano? Fats, Fats Waller. Waller. And they used to, t I mean, it's the whole. So I just wondered what the reception was when it came out and if it, you know, big hit. caught fire or not. Yes. It was certainly a big hit. Both, I mean, with, a, you know, these are still black people. And so there is that. It made a bunch of money. It, made, it didn't cost that much to make. I mean, it's very, you know, the sets are very, very, and you saw there weren't, yeah, probably all the money went to her wardrobe. Who wants that silver dress with the turban? Me. Thank you. Uh, who is the intended audience for this movie? Was it made for the white audience, the black audience, I any audience? I think both. I think, I mean, it would be highly unlikely that this, this movie couldn't play probably in some parts of the country, but there was no, there, since there were no white people in the movie, maybe that would slide through. It's very patriotic, you know, it's for the soldiers, for the soldiers. So it was obviously some kind of um, war effort movie. Here's the thing, Wendell Wilkie and Walter White, Walter White was the head of the NAACP and Wendell Wilkie was a Republican nominee for president, said to, had a luncheon with, this is good Renee, you're gonna like this, um, Mayor, whichever Warner brother, and whichever Zanuck it was, and said, um, the Germans are making inroads into Africa and Latin America, and we need to prove that we are not racists. And that's one of the reasons she got that contract. And that's one of the reasons why that movie came to be. It's very deep and very weird. And it's not just a whole bunch of, I know Renee's like, what the, yeah. And, like, what? And it's not just a bunch of people singing and dancing on a soundstage. If you had, it had, there was a political motivation behind it. So maybe you could say the intended audience was nobody. And the, um, but I'm glad it's here. I don't know what, I don't know how they marketed it. I don't know, you know. I don't know in, if they marketed it outside of, you know, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Newark, and Hollywood. I have no idea. You said she liked to read. Who did she read? What, what author? She, she liked historical nonfiction and, and uh, biographies of, uh, she liked to read about queens. Re <laughs> there you go. Real big on like Catherine the Great and stuff, and stuff like that. Hey, Jenny girl, how you doing? Thanks for coming today. Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, just wanted to say that um, this is my first time seeing this on film. I actually did a women's history paper on your grandmother. Oh, you did? Yeah. You probably know more than me. Um, you know, I'm of a mixed race, so it's just awesome seeing people from different backgrounds and just seeing like her finally on screen. Um, it was cool when I watched the video, or the movie, should I say, I saw so much influence from like Catherine Dunham being a dancer. She's a yeah. famous African-American dancer. Yeah. Yeah. And when I watched the Nicholas Brothers, I could totally see like Janet Jackson, Beyonce, just mm -hmm. how like she took those images and just put them to life. And mm -hmm. I just want to say I'm so grateful the film was here. And me thank too. you so much for taking your time to be here. Thank you so much. No, it's not me. I'm just, you know, here well, to, to DNA, share stuff. DNA from your grandmother. Good job. <laughs> thank you. And thanks for, thanks for writing a paper. That's really cool. What were the circumstances of her marriage to, I think, a white Jew. Wasn't yeah. that rather um, amazing at that time? She was married to a black man named Lewis Jones, who was my paternal grandfather. And they had a rather ugly divorce. And she, then she married a man called Lenny Hayton, who was a musical arranger um, at MGM. And if you watch the PBS special, the PBS American Master special, she says they got married in Paris because it was illegal. Um, in the United States, and they came back to the States when it was legal, and they couldn't find anywhere to live. It's a good story. And then Humphrey Bogart, right? I swear to God, you guys, all this is all the time. Um, Humphrey Bogart and Betty Bacall, Lauren Bacall, um, said, come live in our neighborhood in California, and no one would sell them a house. And so Humphrey Bogart, <laughs> Humphrey Bogart, um, went around the neighborhood and asked all his neighbors if they wanted to sell. He'd knock on doors and say, do you want to sell your house? Knock on a door, do you want to sell your house? And when the person said no, Humphrey Bogart said good because Letty and Lena are moving in down the street and if they don't get their paper or they can't park in their driveway or if the rooster doesn't crow at four o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna come to your house and beat the shit out of you. Wow. That's so cool, right? So Humphrey Bogart is a total hero. 
Um, so, I'm sorry, ma'am. Um, she will say in the PBS Masters that she married him because he was white and it would make her life easier. And she also says that she learned to love him. And they were married for a very long time. He was the man that I knew as my grandpa. I didn't know Lewis Jones. And you have his name? Uh, Lenny Hayton? No, I'm a no, Jenny. No. And he's a Lenny Hayton, and I'm a Jenny Lumet. Got it. Yeah. OK, thank you. Lenny's a good name, though. I guess one thing I, I, I don't know, and I don't know how many people here would know about it, is just in terms of where this fit into the context for this, the frame of reference for this film as a film entirely of African-American, incredibly talented people. Um, one thing that really struck me, because you hear, you've seen so many things, Steven Spielberg, whatever, talking about, we've got to do things to restore all these mm -hmm. films that have been lost and whatever. This is exquisitely good condition, mm -hmm. this it movie. Is, it? Not one speck of dust, the entire movie. But I'm just wondering in the context, are, were there many movies like this, or were there very, very few movies like this? And also, just what part of that is, what did the reviews, and if, if they were viewed at all in mainstream papers like the New York Times, would they say anything like the miraculous Nicholas Brothers, the incredible Lena Horne, or was it always, or was it tendentially very downplayed how much talent these people had? I th my assumption was I don't know about reviews. I can tell you from uh, publicity materials that I happen to have, you know, Bronze Goddess and the sepia this and the wow, bang, zoom, yeah, the, you know. The reviews it, were good. You know, uh, critics really enjoyed, it. I thought especially in the reviews that I've seen, they loved Lena Horne. They just couldn't stop crowing about Lena Horne. Um, having Bill Robinson, you know, not dancing with Shirley Temple, which was mm -hmm. nice. Um, and that Nicholas Brothers segment number. I mean, you know, there's a reason why Fred Astaire said it was the best dance sequence ever filmed. If it's not the best dance sequence ever filmed, then there aren't any. <laughs> really. So, I mean, people got it. In, I, in terms of the context of movies, there were lots of these sort of what they called all-colored films and these all-colored musicals, like Cabin in the Sky also mm -hmm. fit into that category. And there were a lot of them. I mean, not all of them survived to this day and are held in the same esteem, but uh, there were a lot. Whiz. The, oh, 78? 78. Right. Whiz. That was fun. And who played Glinda, the good witch? My grandma. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, went, I was 11, and I went to the after party at Studio 54. It was really fun. Wow. It was so fucked up, though. Like, what were my parents thinking? <laughs> I was 11, but it was fun. That was fun. No, that's a story. That's a story. Yeah. yeah. So, are we done? Yeah. Oh. Can, we, can we do... Do we have time for one more? Is there somebody? Yes, ma'am. There are less than 10 edits in the Nicholas, Nicholas Brothers, um, I've counted. Um, and it, they're mostly in the beginning when Cab Calloway first mm -hmm. goes over them and they're making their way down the tables. But when you look at the splits, there are no edits in those scenes. None. And if you look at the zebra number, it's, it's the same. There aren't a lot. You have to cut away sometimes. But if you think about what terrible movie did I see lately in a hotel? Oh, it was a movie called, I'm sorry, did anybody make the movie called Burlesque with Christina Aguilera? Okay, good, because that movie that's, sucked. That's a thing? Really? No. But a, there was a dance sequence or an act, and there were probably a hundred cuts in, and she can sing, and there were a hundred cuts in this number, and I'm like, oh, why, what did she, you know, cut, okay. Who and then Christina's exhausted and has to, whatever. Um, I don't think there was time or money, and also MGM put you through the ringer in terms of training. And um, these people knew that they didn't have a lot of rope, so to speak. I think, I think in some cases, the edits were only to change a camera angle. They weren't because the performers couldn't keep going. And as she said, there wasn't a lot of money, so you weren't getting retake after retake after retake. So a, that's, that's just pure talent. Yeah, and a reel back there, a bet, and a reel is, is nine minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so you could can shoot for nine minutes, and then you would have to stop and change reels, because this, you know, this is not digital. Um, I learned that from my dad. So I think that if you could go, because I haven't timed that Nicholas Brothers sequence. I don't know what it is. I don't know exactly what it is. It feels like it's nine. 
I don't know. It's almost hard to say. It's just I wish it would go on forever, mm -hmm. frankly. But me too. Um, and they look if like you know, there's, there's a long moment when you know, just before they start the splits, when they sort of go, there's not another edit until they take the bow at the end. Mm -hmm. So there's probably maybe three to four minutes with no edit. That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So I think we're done. And thank you. Thank you so much.